So in this session, I'm going to take you through a few simple workflows, just common tasks that editors often need to do. We're going to have a look at how we can use uh, Fusion to do it. And the first thing I'm going to look at is round tripping from result. So here I've got a timeline full of different clips we'll be working on. And the first one, we just want to uh, blur out this Seiko logo. So what we're going to do is simply select the clip, right click, and choose New Fusion Connect Clip. We'll give it a name. And we don't need to export uh, Alpha. We'll not put it in a custom location. We will use the source media for the Fusion Connect Clip. And we want to open the Fusion Connect Clip. I'll click Open. And there we go. It loads it in to Fusion. And you'll see it's got what's called a saver node on the back end and so everything that we want to do to our clip we do between this loader node which is bringing the footage in and the saver node which is sending the footage back out again all right so in this shot we have the Seiko logo here and we just want to blur it out and so we'll find a nice frame with minimal amount of motion blur this is good and we're going to use the planar tracker to do all the dirty work so I'm going to hold down the shift key and spacebar to bring up the tool picker and type in PLAN for planar it returned add the planar tracker node so if you're new to node based compositing it's a pretty simple concept uh, in fact I think it's simpler to understand in a lot of ways than your typical timeline stacking uh, it's just that people have learned timelines but if you'd learn from the start with nodes they'd probably make a little bit more sense to you I have a feeling but anyway uh, just think of it as streams of water flowing through pipes so you've got water flowing down into the planar tracker pipe and then back down out to the final render so with the planar tracker added I'm going to zoom in on my view and I'm just going to click to create a simple shape around the logo I'm trying to replace. Now a planar tracker actually tracks motion vectors in a certain region of the image. So if some parts are obscured, it can still track the other parts. So that's why I've included the uh, writing down the bottom here as well as the main logo. So if the main logo goes off the screen, we've still got some other information to track. And then I just click the set reference frame at the current frame. And I'm going to track back to the start of the clip first. I'm at frame 51 right now. So I'll track back and you can see there we have it. Uh, the viewer on the left obviously makes a lot more sense. The one on the right isn't updating for speed purposes. And it's identifying, you see those little trails, it's identifying specific pixel areas that it can track from one frame to the next and uh, away it goes so we go back to the reference frame which is frame 51 and then track forward again the other way now the planar tracker in fusion is a solid tool it does have limitations so there are certain shots that if you're really going to do a lot of planar tracking you'll want to invest in mocha ofx which is the Mocha plugin that drops straight into uh, Fusion. And you can also use it with other OFX compatible applications. All right, there we have it completely tracked. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use this tracking data to actually apply the blur to our footage. And there are some easier ways to do this. But I'm going to get, go and uh, show you a quick way that really doesn't require us doing any funky expressions or those kinds of things. So I'll do the simplest way. It, it's a little clunky. There are easier ways to do it, but they'd require me showing you a little bit more of the app. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a polygon node, which is the standard tool inside of Fusion for doing rotoscoping. And let's go back to our reference frame right here. and I will now with my polygon tool just create a shape specifically around the area I want to blur. So 
that's going to be this. Notice this is different to what we did before because I included this writing down the bottom, which for argument's sake here, we're, we're not needing to blur out. Now in the planar tracker properties up here on the right, I'm going to choose a corner pin. So if I have a look at what that looks like right now, uh, I'll go to the foreground only mode. And you'll see it's not really doing what we want. And that's because what we need to do is we need to come in and actually, because we built our little blur area to the scale of the full frame, we actually need to make our corner pin fit the full frame. So if I open the corner pin section here, I can go down to the reference time positions and I want to say, make this thing take up the whole screen, which is uh, the coordinates are zero to one left to right and zero to one bottom to top. So top left is going to be zero, one. Top right is gonna be one, one. Bottom left is gonna be zero, zero. And bottom right is going to be uh, one, zero. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna feed the polygon into a special input called the corner pin input of the planar tracker. So now because my corner pin reference has been stretched out to fit the entire frame, it's not making any changes at the reference frame, the start frame to my polygon. But at all the other frames, it's going to go and try and keep that in time to the changes made to the rest of the shot. So it's going to keep it up with whatever the camera is doing. And uh, we can see that superimposed if I say uh, foreground over background. Let's click in here and press Command F to zoom in. And you'll see that little block is now perfectly lining up with the area that we want to blur out. All right, let's actually do a blur. So I'm going to add a blur node. I clicked in the gray space to deselect nodes so this blur node doesn't get added to anything by default. Now I'm just going to take a connection from the output of the original footage, drop it into the blur. And you'll see now if I adjust the blur, I'm blurring the entire image. And I'm going to blur it until I can't see the logo. What I want to do is limit the blurring to only the area where the logo is. Well, we have that. That's this guy right here. My planar tracker is just that area. And if I set it to foreground only, I'm only seeing the mat of that area. So the blur actually has a mask input. And if I take my little tracked white square and say use that as a mask to mask off where the blur is being applied, lo and behold, I'm now just blurring in that region. And you'll see that that is consistent across time. Now, if we look a little closer, the blur has kind of an awkward cutoff there. By the way, there's a little high quality button in the lower right here that uh, gives us the full resolution final preview, which cleans up the edge a little bit. But we can still see it's a very harsh clipped edge. So what we probably want to do is take our hard edged mat that we have here and add just a little blur to it. So I can do that by selecting my planar tracker, hitting shift space to bring up the tool picker and adding another blur. I'll just type in BLU blur. There we go. Another blur just to blur the edges around my mat. So if I select this blur node, press one to load it into viewer one, you see I've just added a blur to soften the edges. And so I don't see that quite so distinct there. All right, the last thing to do here is, this is my final blur here. I need to take the output of that and feed it into that saver node that's gonna render back out. So now with that done, I'm just going to click render and I'm just gonna render the first 50 frames just to uh, keep time on my side here. Start render. Away it goes. All right, if I go back to 
resolve, lo and behold, it's automatically loaded the clip in. So we've got this blur working, but let's say we want to give our client some options. So I'm going to right click and choose Fusion Connect, create new version. So that creates a new version of the comp and it has the blur already set up. You know what? I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to add a pixelation effect. So I'm going to add a scale node and I'm going to scale it down to one tenth of its original scale. Let's just put that in. So now I'm one tenth of the original scale and I'll set the scale type to nearest neighbor, neighbor should work. And then I'm going to right away scale back up to 10 times the original size. So now instead of a blurred version, I have a pixelated version and I'm simply going to use this instead of my blur, but I need to merge that over the top. So I'm going to add a merge node and I'm going to say merge this over the top of the original clip, but only do it where I have my mask. Now I'll just feed this into the same input that we were using for our mask for our previous clip. In fact, I can delete those now because that was part of the older version. And lo and behold, you'll see we've now got this pixelation effect going on like so. Now uh, we hook up the render node, the saver node that I uh, had hiding away down here. Click out the render and I'll just leave the frame range 0 to 350 just for the interest of time again. And we click start render. Away it goes. Okay, switch back to resolve and lo and behold there is our pixelated version. So now the client can choose. We can sit there with the client and right before their eyes we can pull up our blurred version instead and they can make the call right from the timeline uh, which is actually a pretty sweet way to work. Okay, next up let's look at some secondaries correction. I'm gonna forego the whole round tripping from Resolve, you get the idea, and we're just going to start straight inside of Fusion. So let's have a look at this clip. Uh, we've got a guy about to hop on a bike with a backpack bag on his back. And let's, uh, for the moment, assume that this is the hero backpack, that this is the uh, brand that we're advertising. And you'll see just because of the low resolution of the footage, that we don't really have a lot of detail in the bag. It looks pretty washed and blown out. And there's only so much we can do for this, honestly. Uh, this is pretty low resolution footage. Uh, this was shot with a modern camera and we had raw or 10 or 12 bit source media, we'd have a lot more to deal with. But in this case, we're dealing with something that I think was an MP3 at some point in its lifetime. Uh, sorry, MP4. Uh, so. Let's see if we can do something to clean it up. So first thing we're going to do is we want to be able to track just the bag to isolate it. So I'm going to add a plane out tracker. And I'm going to draw a shape around the area I want to track, which is obviously all this goodness. All right. With that done, I click my set for the reference frame, which in this case is going to be frame 55, and I'll just track forward. And away it goes. Again, you'll see those little track areas with the tadpole tails telling you the things, the features that it's trying to track. And it seems to be tracking reasonably well here all the way through. And now we'll go back to the reference frame, which is 55, and track the other way. So with all the tracking complete, it's time to actually roto the bag and to try and use it for a secondary color correction. So the first thing we do is actually come down here and click this custom button, Create Planar Transform. 
and that creates a little node that allows our rotor shape to keep up in time. So I'm going to add that polygon node again and I'll connect it into the planar transform node and let me just push the planar tracker off to the side here for the moment and we're going to just do a simple merge for just for now so we can see what's going on the simple merge of our roto that we haven't actually drawn yet through that planar transform and we're going to composite it over the bag so if we go to the rotor shape here and if I just quickly I'm going to be real quick and dirty here because I don't have time with all I want to get through to articulately rotoscope this thing but let's just say that was some perfect roto and in fact in my merge I'll come in here to this little guy bring the blend down just so we can see what's going on maybe around there obviously my roto was not great at all so I'll come in here and just tweak it a little bit that'll do uh, whoops stay okay so what I can do now is you'll see as I move across time the rotor is already keeping up based on the planar transform from our tracking data and then I can just go to in between frames and start to clean up my edging okay so I'm not going to do too much here but you get the idea it's kind of vaguely keeping in uh, line with the movement of the bag. Obviously I'd go in and do a few more in between frames to really dial in this roto if I wanted to. But let's say that roto is nicely lined up all the way through thanks to the help of our planner tracker. How do we actually use that? Well, here's my secondary. I'm going to add a color correction. Shift space, type in color. There's the color corrector and I'm just going to connect that in to the background input and first off let's just go ahead and try to pull out tease out a little bit more detail in this bag so I'll go to levels and I'll bring the bright point down a little bit and then try and play with the contrast to get some detail a bit more detail out of that bag And if I press Command P or press this little disable, I can see that, oh, we've definitely added back some contrast. I should probably go in with the curves and try to pull down the uh, some detail in the super brights. But, uh, well, let me see if I can actually just do it with the highlight control here. Not really. All right, let's just leave it as it is. So as before, this is after. So what we're going to do now is, I don't need this merge. That was just temporarily while I was setting things up. Here's my shape. I'm going to feed that into the mask and put in my color correction. And now the color correction is only applying, whoops, click in the viewer first is only being applied to the bag like so now obviously we can see my bad roto job here and partly that's just because I didn't actually go through and roto and adjust everything but also we probably want to add a little bit of blur so after my plane out transform I'll just hit shift space type in BLU for blur add a blur node and just in fact let me select the blur press 1 to load it into the left hand side viewer you can see what I'm doing just adding a little bit of softness to the border of that and so now this color correction is just correcting the back um, it's obviously going a little too far and darkening the edges of the shirt so just as an example, this is going a little deeper, but as an example of the sorts of things you can do with 
the flexible node-based architecture here. I'm going to add a Lumic here, and I will feed that in like so. There's my Lumic key, and I'm going to adjust that just to highlight the brighter parts of the back. So we'll go there. So I don't want to highlight the shirt. I'll get something like this. That'll do it. And now I'll say I want my original mat to only live. I'll add a merge node straight after that blur. And I'll say I only want it to exist when it's inside the Luma key. So let's feed that in. And in the merge node, I change the operation to in. And there we have it. It'll only work when it's inside that Luma key area. See, here's the original, here's the new one. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that blur, shift drag to pull it off there, because I should really be blurring after the inside. So this is the inside operation. Whoops, making a mess of things. And you'll see all the weird uh, banding that we have here. So we'll add the blur after that by shift dragging it over the new connector. And this is what it looks like. Maybe I can even dial back on the blur a little bit now. So this was before our color correction. This is after. And the blur is a little strong. That's why we're still seeing some banding here. And so I could actually come in and use, say, a mat control node. Whoops. Add a mat control node and use that to adjust where border that mat lives. And I can play with the gamma settings. And there we have it. Some nice detail restored. If that's too strong, I can always make adjustments to how much of that color corrector is blended in over the original. So I can come in and just dial it in so I've got a little bit more detail than it was blown out to before. And now you'll see that our hero bag actually has a little bit more detail to it. And if we bother to take a little bit more time to dial in that roto, it would go all the way through. Okay, in this next little tip, we're going to do a screen replacement. And uh, this is a pretty common thing to do. We won't use the planar tracker for this one. We'll just use the good old fashioned regular tracker. So I'm going to add tracker node. And you'll see we've got four corners to the screen over here. So I'm just going to go ahead and line these up. Um, I know this is a bit of a cheat because it's CG, uh, but it's actually a pretty accurate shot. One of the things I like about this is there are no markers. I'm not a huge fan of markers on screen replacements. When you have any kind of decent uh, edge detail like this, it's much easier just to track that rather, to have, rather than having to paint out the markers. And we don't have any annoying green screen or anything in the monitor so we actually can see the reflections of the scene and harvest those and you'll see how that works in a moment. So let me just add four trackers. There's tracker two. Move that over here. Tracker three. Move over here and there's tracker four. All right. Now I just need to get those a little bit closer.
and away we track. Track's complete. So now we pop into the operation tab of the tracker and we say we want to do a uh, corner positioning and you'll see that it's all gone crisscrossed here and that's because I actually have to say what's what. Well, I've, top left tracker is tracker one, that's right. Top right tracker is actually tracker four and I've got tracker two listed as the default so I gotta fix that. Uh, bottom right is going to be tracker three and bottom left is tracker two. And now you'll see we have this nice little square lineup and all we have to do is feed the shot that we want to comp onto the screen into the foreground input and lo and behold there it is. Now our corners probably aren't perfectly aligned First of all, let me turn on high quality so we can see them better. And so what we can do is go back to the trackers tab and we can pick, uh, what was this tracker? It was tracker two. So we can go in, select tracker two, and we can adjust the X and Y to position it perfectly in the corner of the screen. And I could go ahead and do that for all four corners just by clicking on their trackers and adjusting them. Um, the few other things we could do with this shot is we could soften the edges of the screen so they bed in a little bit. I'm not going to worry too much about that. One thing I do want to show you is the blend. If I bring the blend down, the image is all the way off the screen. If I bring it up, I can actually choose how much reflection I see. But before I do that, let's go back to operations, change the apply mode to screen. So that's going to give us a much more natural version. Or we could use lighten. Um, either way, let's just go with lighten for this one. And now I can choose how much that gets added over the top. But I'm still seeing those reflections and I have control over how natural things look. One other thing, I'd have to rotoscope the, the finger here, uh, obviously, so that it doesn't get comped over. But that uh, creates a very natural blend with the reflections from the room because we had a blackened screen. Nice, quick, easy way to do screen inserts that are much more believable than just comping over some nasty green or blue and not getting those reflections from the room. Now we move on to sky replacement. Now this is a really common problem in modern uh, digital cinema because people are shooting with cameras that either lack the dynamic range to capture the sky properly or they don't know how to stop their camera down to get the sky correctly or they're just shooting at a lower frame rate, uh, sorry, a lower data rate and so they just don't have the dynamic range, even if in theory their camera supports it. Uh, so what do you do when you end up with a blown out sky? Well, what most people do and almost never works well is they add a Lumic here. So let's do that real quick. Bring in my Lumic here here. Let's look at the alpha channel and we're going to crank everything up so we're just left with sky and then we're going to make the sky nice and solid. Okay, so now we're going to mat and in fact we want to invert that mat so we only leave the area where we want the sky to be added and here's our sky. It's actually not the right size so let's quickly add a resize node. Shift space, RES for resize Say OK. It's going to resize it. It's a little bit of a cheat, stretches it, but who's going to notice? And now we'll add a merge node and merge the city over the top of the sky. And this is pretty typically your result. You end up with these horrible, whoops, <laughs> end up with these horrible haloed edges around everything. And they're almost impossible to get rid of because they're 
really that transitional edge with a bright object behind and you're trying to replace it with something that's not as bright it just doesn't work so don't do that forget about that you know the first thing we will do is we're going to go ahead and quickly make a dirty holdout mat and I'll show you how to do that I'm gonna add the roto tool the polygon I don't want it actually connected so I'm gonna disconnect it and I'm just going to quickly roto around the edge of that mat now this is a lockdown shot so it's no reason not to be articulate here except that I'm lazy and I've got a lot to get through so I'm just gonna do a real quick and dirty hedge mat here but basically all the stuff that's away from the edge that we don't really care about we just want to make sure it's solid we can capture in this mat here so I'll go ahead and do that click around the edges and come back and join right back to this dot so that's my rough edge now let's actually look at how we deal with replacing the sky so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use a node called the channel boolean node now when you add a channel boolean you'll see you actually have two options channel boolean three bowl or channel boolean bowl the three bowl is actually for working with 3d textures in uh, fusions 3d environment we just want the good old-fashioned bowl not the three bowl so we choose that people coming from other apps like nuke um, the different operators for compositing are kind of broken up between the regular merge node and this channel booleans in the case of what we want to do which is a minimum we need the channel booleans node so now we're going to connect our clouds to the channel boolean as well to the other input and the final step here actually flip them over is the operation we want is a minimum now what a minimum does is when two sets of pixels overlap so you see we've got our city with the blown out sky and our clouds at any point where the two images overlap when we try to put them together in this channel booleans the darkest one wins so you'll see in this blown out sky area the clouds are going to be the darkest so they'll be in the resulting image but where our foreground is darker it'll win so let's see what the result is um, nothing too great just yet because for some reason I haven't got my operation set to minimum so I'll go ahead and change that to minimum and you'll see things look pretty hideous because the clouds are darker pretty much everywhere and are winning so what we do is we add a color corrector node to the clouds and just using the brightness I can start playing with the levels until the clouds are only replacing in the areas we want them to so let's set it right about there and you'll see right away that we have a lot more detail than we used to have and uh, what's great about this especially if we're in float space and I'll make sure we are by going back to my source image in the format sorry the import section setting it to float 16 we don't really have to do that to both because once one's in float the other one will automatically be promoted but what's great about that is if we add a color corrector later that does bring the overall highlights down let's just go to levels for example all of that cloud detail is still going to be there whereas if I try to do that same operation to the original source clip instead doesn't matter what we do clipped is clipped 
so that we're never getting that detail back no matter how dark we go but with uh, our new shot our new clouds are going to color correct nicely no matter what we do in the shot and uh, the last little step we do here is use our mat to make sure we comp back any foreground areas and simplest way to do that is we'll add a mat control node I'm going to hook that up to my original source footage and drop this into the foreground input of the mat control and in the mat control I say hey I want to combine alpha and I want you to post multiply the image and that cuts away everything except the uh, part that we want and now we can just merge that over the top of our current channel boolean image so we're basically pasting back the solid uh, foreground areas in all these regions and that's the result looks pretty similar but if you look carefully in fact let me just load these up in the different buffers uh, oh I haven't turned the light on for this one Had my viewer lets different. Here we go. You can just see certain areas that got killed off by the minimum get restored by this operation. And we want that. We don't want uh, any damage to the foreground area that's not right in the sky or on the borderline area. So there we have it. So we went from this to this and that is probably the best way to do a sky replacement to use that minimum operator you get that nice detail back and you can adjust the uh, intensity by just doing a simple color correction on the sky brightening or darkening it until that minimum effect works the way you want it to with the edge detail and the rest of the shot all right, for our last gag of the day, we are going to take a look at rig removal. So obviously this particular shot has a whole lot of rig. We're just going to focus on a kind of a made up example here, but a pretty typical situation where we have a C stand here that we don't want in the shot. And we have these plates hanging from the wall on the side that we should be able to see throughout this section of the shot, but that C stands in the way. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we need to uh, garbage mat out the C stand. And the old sheet, here's one I prepared earlier. I've already gone ahead and done a quick nasty roto job just around the basic outline of that C stand. So now I'm going to add our friend the plane out tracker. And the planar tracker actually has a garbage mat input. If I bring this in and option drag it over the top, you'll see occlusion mask is one of the options. That's a fancy word for garbage mat. And now I'm going to go ahead and whoops, draw a shape around the things I'm trying to track. Like so. And set this as my reference time and then start tracking. All right, our track's complete. So now what we want to do is find a frame where the C-stand isn't covering up these plaques. And right around frame 51, the C-stand's finally left them alone. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a still frame at frame 51. And the easiest way to do that is if you hit shift space and add, choose time, there's something called time stretcher. And 
it's going to attach itself because I didn't click in the gray space first. And you'll see it's got an expression there. I'm going to right click on the source time and choose remove time stretch of one source time, which it does. And we're going to just type in the frame we're at, which is frame 51. And now it will only ever display frame 51. So it's going to freeze frame on frame 51 no matter where we're at. Okay, so now that we have this frozen in time, we're going to add our planar tracker. I'll just do a copy and paste over here. So we've got a pasted version of our planar tracker, and we're going to choose corner pin, which will be a little bit weird. Uh, in fact, what we want to do is put the original source footage in the background input and our time stretched one into the corner pin input. And you'll see it's now, whoops, I always forgot to click in the viewer. Uh, you'll see it's corner pinning the full footage into a tiny little area. So this is a little clunky. There are some other workflows, but uh, this is the simplest one to show. And what we're going to do is open the corner pin section here and we could adjust these or we could quite easily just come in here real quick grab the four corners of our corner pin and reposition them back so that the entire footage is taking up the full frame now that means we have to kind of come in here at a real close level and just really dial these in. If you get really close in, they'll just snap in, but uh, whoops. Have it and lower right corner. Now I'm being a little lazy here, but if I perfectly line them up, uh, you wouldn't see any difference when we go from here to here. Hopefully, we don't see too much. Um, and the last thing I'm going to do is add a roto of the area that I want uh, to keep safe. Now, if I was doing this properly, I would probably go into Photoshop or use the clone tools inside of, of Fusion here and completely clone out uh, the C stand so I got some nice wall there. Or I, there are some techniques where I could actually grab. Uh, other frames and combine them, but we're not going to worry too much about that right now. And we're just going to show the basic technique. So here we are. I'm saying I want to replace the C standard other frames with this unobstructed view here at this frame. So I've got that. I'm going to add another Mac control node straight after my time stretch. So here's my current source footage. I pop this in foreground input and set the map control to combine alpha and turn on post multiply image. And now you'll see I have that one little section. And first of all, in the planar tracker here, I want to say foreground only. So we're only seeing that little section. Now I do need to pull up a tiny little bit left of Let's see, stand there. There we go. Okay, so we're only looking at that little section because it, we're only looking at what's coming through the foreground here. We're ignoring the background. And I'm just going to merge this back over the original shot. So I'll click in the gray space, shift space, add a merge. Connect that to the background. And then add this as foreground like so. Now what this planar tracker is doing 
is it is keeping that little chunk of wall in line with the movement of the camera at other frames. So now, with any luck, if we look at the final merge, we should be able to go into earlier frames and you'll see wherever the C stand crosses that area that we just fed in, it becomes invisible because we're basically pasting a tracked in version of the back wall of the top of the rigging. And that wraps things up. We've just seen five simple ways to uh, use Fusion for common editing tasks, common cleanup situations. Hopefully that gives you some ideas of how you could put it to work for you.